Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're continuing on with our Expectations series this year. Got a couple good ones for you today. Isaiah Likely and Rock Yasin, uh, both expected to be fairly key contributors to the Ravens this year. Here to talk to me about both of them is Brandon Croxton. Brandon, how you doing? Hey, good. Hey, I'm doing well, Ken. Good to talk to you as always. Uh, great to have you back on the show, Brandon. You've become something of a regular here. Really appreciate your uh, your contributions to it and, and uh, looking forward to doing more shows with you. But I guess we'll start with Isaiah Likely, a, a second-year tight end now, uh, who just turned 23 in April, got drafted out of Coastal Carolina in the 22 draft, uh, and immediately vaulted onto the scene with both his camp and preseason play. Yeah, absolutely. Like He really showed out uh, right at the beginning of training camp, and it really carried over into the preseason. Um, he, he looked like a you know, just a diamond in the rough. Um, he's, he's big, he's six, four. He's really, he's really a smooth route runner. Um, he, he has good hips. He can move. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what he ran in the 40, uh, coming out of college, but he can go to the, uh, he, he can get to the intermediate zones pretty easily. Yeah, that was one of the problems that Coastal Carolina had some sort of funny track situation where a couple of players ran a lot slower than expected. I want to say likely was in the 470 or 474 range. It wasn't impressive, whatever it was, particularly at tight end. And that hurt his draft stock, certainly, I think, around the league. And one of the reasons he fell to the Ravens where he did. And the second tight end drafted by the Ravens, which is a good formula, of course, we know for Ravens tight end success. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I say... Uh... Coastal Carolina's loss was our our win, our gain, because um, he plays a lot faster than that four seven speed that he ran. Um, and yeah, to me, he he looks like he's a NFL starting caliber tight end. Um, you know, and we'll see how he improves over this over this next year. Yeah, it's going to be interesting what kind of role he has with the Ravens. But I want to talk about a little bit about that preseason in, in some greater detail because it was really a historic preseason. Caught all 12 balls thrown to him for 12 yards per target. Had a very rare 100-yard receiving game in a preseason. In the preseason, that never happens, folks. I mean, you know, you, you're first of all you're trying to get everybody some playing time. Your star receivers generally don't play. Your your second set of guys is playing with a bad quarterback typically, so they don't typically make a bunch of plays. So Isaiah likely having, I think it was eight catches for 100 yards exactly, uh, was really a remarkable game. The other thing we saw that was really troublesome in the preseason was likely getting some holding calls on the run plays. And didn't come with a great pedigree as a run tight end, run blocking tight end, or blocking tight end, period. Uh, but that was something I thought really improved during the season. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting. Like, um, he, I think he had two holding calls on consecutive plays, or very close to each other in the preseason game. And after the game, he talked about it. He said, "This isn't. This was a. It was a technique issue. It's not an effort issue, or you know, lack of strength issue." It, it, he was talking about his hands. Uh, he just didn't have proper hand placement, and um, he said he was going to fix it that week, and he really did. Um, he. He cut it down throughout the season, and he he really didn't have many issues uh, on that hold, withholding and the run blocks at, at all. It is he had one holding call the whole year is week one at the Jets. So you're kind of thinking this is this is confirming what we've seen in the preseason, and he was shut down for that third game, or at least he, maybe he was active, but he didn't play uh, in that third game uh, because he you know obviously that he was he was so obviously part of their plans they didn't want to risk him, but. Um, it, so the, the, the game against the Jets, he came back, he had a holding call, didn't do anything as a receiver, zero for four in terms of targets. So kind of a reversal of all the good receiving news, a confirmation of some poor um, uh, you know, blocking news. But that was the end of the bad news for Isaiah Likely, really, for the 2022 season. He's a terrific player the rest of the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he broke the uh, Ravens tight end rookie record for targets and receptions in the season. I mean, that's better better than Todd Heap, better than Dennis Pitta, even better than uh, Mark Andrews. And um, Mark Andrews had a much better uh, rookie season as far as making the most out of his targets, but mm -hmm. uh, likely outperformed all of them uh, as a rookie. And um, he had a he, he, I think his breakout game was that Tampa Bay game on that Thursday night. He caught a touchdown and made um, 
several plays on third downs, and um, that was kind of his breakout. And he had a hundred yard game at the end of the season, which yep. was uh, right at right with the Bengals with um, with Brown as the quarterback. So I think all of that is you know a preview of good things to come. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about that first game against Tampa Bay because he caught six out of seven balls. That was the game the Ravens lost Bateman, and it was kind of a precursor of what was going to happen the rest of the way. I think Bateman might have had one target in that game, but effectively he was uh, he was done for the year at that point, and he ended up having the surgery, the Liz Frank surgery we're still hoping he recovers from. But uh, he caught six out of seven balls um, that day. Uh, really was a was a big factor in that game. I want to say he had a touchdown, but I'm looking for it right now to make sure I'm, yeah, I'm correct he did about have a that. Touchdown. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Back in the end zone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and then the next week he had a touchdown uh, as w- his only reception against the Saints. It was, but it was yeah. it was, it was only five you know, five targets in that game, and only one reception, which wasn't good. But the one reception was a beauty. It was an, as I recall it, it was an extended play on a roll right where he was able to find space in level three, perfect place to find it, um, and get behind the defense for Lamar to make an easy pitch and catch throw to him on the move. Uh, so many things to like when you see a play like that from a young young receiver for the Ravens. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it, I, I think all, all the traits were on display there. Um, him being able to have that speed, um, getting outside, um, him having that connection with Lamar on an extended play um, is, is obviously, you know, something very encouraging and really huge. And, you know, he has the route running and speed to get, get, you know, past the defense into that second and third level. And that's, that's really what you want to see from a, from a young player. Yeah, it was just it was uh, was absolutely terrific. It was a, it was one of the moments where you really said uh, he's 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 here to stay. And what co- was coincident with that was really a big upturn in his run blocking, which was very necessary. I mean, it, it, Ravens tight ends just have to be able to run block. It doesn't mean you have to be able to block in line, you know, and and, and be able to take on a, a defensive tackle, but it does mean or or a defensive end, let's say, but it does mean you have to get out to level two, level three, square up on the receiver, keep uh, sorry on the defensive backer or maybe the linebacker, keep your feet and be able to make some progress against that guy without holding. Uh, it's, it's kind of a lot of things to do. Uh, you know, we've seen Miles Boykin, who was exceptional at it in terms of keeping keeping his length. I mean, you got to do other things well too, obviously. But in, in terms of of uh, keeping his arms outstretched, uh, we've seen some other tight ends who've been a pretty pretty good at it. But I thought Isaiah likely was just outstanding down the stretch as a run blocker in this season. Yeah, I mean, especially in a Greg Roman offense where they run so much, uh, you know, two tight end sets, and um, you know they they run the ball so much and they run it you know, that's the key to the offense and is running the ball is getting those, uh, getting those tight ends to be able to, you know, hook the linebacker or kick out the linebacker and, or even get to the second level to a safety. I mean, those are what change, uh, what turn five yard runs into 25 yard runs. And he, he, he was, you know, definitely exceeded expectations, especially for a rookie. I mean, it's, especially, you know, for a fourth round rookie, maybe you expect that from a first rounder that's played in a big time school at a big time college, but a small school fourth round pick for him to come in and really hold his own and perform well in the run game is, you know, very encouraging. Yeah. I I agree tremendously. And, and uh, you know what, what was remarkable, the Ravens offense really moved to this ultra heavy scheme and likely ended up being a very key player in it. And it, just to remind people a little bit, the Ravens last year played probably the heaviest scheme in a relative sense of any team in NFL history. If not that, very close to it. In recent years, um, the highest number of fullbacks plus tight ends plus OL6s per play was turned in by the 2019 Vikings who had 1.99. And the Ravens were up north of 2.3 for, for the season, which is ridiculously higher than the, than the highest in recent years. And if, if you if you look back, even in the 1970s, when they, you know, there was a lot of 22 out there, a lot of 22 personnel with only one wide receiver, obviously, that fuels a lot of these larger packages. Um, there still uh, were not because there were more teams, you know, playing heavier at the time. It was less 
uh, uh, significant for a team to to have maybe maybe two point three. I don't know if there even was a team that had even two point three. But in any case, what I'm saying is this was the heaviest scheme at least in decades, and probably in the history of the NFL or close to it, and likely fit right into it. I mean, he's a guy who is one of the heavies, and he's also a guy who is one of the receiving threats and could be split left or right, either split wide or split in the in the uh, uh, in the slot. Uh, to uh, fuel a lot of this, end up being a very valuable player for the Ravens. Yeah, and and I really like the matchup ability that he brings in the receiving game. Is yeah, like you were saying, he splits out. He can split out to the slot, and he can, you know, be he's six four, so he could be that big slot on a smaller corner, and mm-hmm. he can be uh, too quick for if you try to match up with him safety. And he can even go out wide as a, you know, as a wide, type, uh, wide receiver. Um, and again, six, four, you could, there's jump ball potential, especially in the red zone, things like that. And he, you know, he can be, I think an excellent red zone target it, at the very least in the offense this year. Yeah, I, definitely a, uh, a guy who took a few snaps at least outside on at the X after Bateman was down, the Ravens didn't really have anybody at all. Uh, even going into this year, if Bateman is not the X, the Ravens are, are very short on true X receivers. Like, they, they could, I guess, put Obi uh, uh, Beckham there. They could put um, uh, Aguilar there, I suppose. He's really not the right kind of player for that. But uh, their their options at X uh, were fairly limited, are fairly limited this year, and they were even more limited last year when they really didn't have anyone. Right, exactly. I I think a, a lot of that was out of necessity because once Bateman went down, there was really yeah a, not not a whole lot at the wide receiver position that could do much of anything. So, but yeah. again, like I I really do think he made the most of his opportunity. Like um, Bateman going down, you know, it hurt the team, but he it it really gave him an opportunity to step up, and in, I think in a lot of ways he really did. All right, well, let's let's we need to talk about a, a couple of weaknesses. The one, the the one major one, the biggest one of all, is yards per target at six point two, and there are a couple things going on there. First of all, he suffered some from having Huntley uh, throw into him for a lot of that, and Huntley, the ball has to be kind of schemed out of his hands. Uh, ends up being a much shorter uh, uh, um, stick the ball in there kind of offense uh, at at short range. Uh, fewer long ball shots uh, with him. And we saw that again this year. We saw it in spades in 2021 when he really turned Marquise Brown into a five yard per target receiver, which is just, you know, that shouldn't happen. Uh, but oh, yeah. but doing it to likely, um, if you include the wild card game where likely was fantastic, um, uh, then uh, he still had a 6.2 yards per target with Brown, which is, uh, sorry, with Huntley, which is his overall average for the season. But um, he was higher than that with Jackson um, uh, in the early part of the season. And I didn't calculate it separately. But he was 6.2 for the regular season. He was uh, right around 8 in the wild card game. Um, and then he was only 6.2 total, including regular season and wild card game with Huntley. So obviously he was better than 6.2 with Jackson. And better still, if you toss out the want to toss out the first 0 for 4 against the Jets in week one, it was – it was some bad weather. It was his first game. I think there would be some justification for looking at weeks two through the last Jackson week and seeing where was he in terms of yards per target. But I, I, how do you think he can go about improving that number in 2023? Yeah, so um, yeah, I think you also had to throw in a few drops. He had a few drops. Um, that was number two. As well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, – yeah, obviously drops, uh, you know, can, can account for that. Um, there, there was, uh, you know, some, some miscommunication, I guess, probably in him learning the offense. Um, you could see he was not always on the same page as Lamar, um, running the wrong route or turning inside when he should have turned outside, things like that, where you, you think things like that. And, you know, a pass goes incomplete him, you know, which are rookie mistakes and things that, that happen. Um, coachable. It's, yeah, coach, very coachable things. And um, 
I think those two things you could see a consistent, uh, you know, a nice uh, bump in his yards per target. And I also think, I don't know if he necessarily 100% gained uh, Lamar's trust uh, throughout the season. And um, I think that's something he, he, you know, he can work on. And, you know, if, if you drop a ball, like on a third down, something like that, a quarterback is like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to go to him next time, even if it's there. And you could see sometimes occasionally Lamar hesitate when he's throwing to him. Um, but yeah, I, all of those things are coachable. All those things can, you know, more reps and can get it done. It's it's a good point. He didn't have a lot of time with Jackson before Jackson was done for the year after that Tampa Bay New Orleans double where he, he really seemed to be getting his share of targets. Then they had one game where he played. That was the Carolina game where he caught one of three for one yard. That's not obviously not going to do it. Then he was inactive against Jacksonville, and I don't recall the reason, but it probably was some minor injury that he was working through. Came back against Denver when Huntley came on in that game and had a you know an okay game, four four or four catches for thirty yards. Uh, not, nothing to get excited about, but but at least he's back. You know, getting targets at that point. But some of that was Huntley because that Denver game. Lamar left fairly early, is right. my yeah, recollection. Like yeah. the, or I think early in the second quarter, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned drops as well. Uh, now, tight ends never have a whole lot of drops. So it's always a small number you're working with. Uh, but the, the statistic that is a little bit disturbing is that likely had four drops on 40 catchable balls per PFF. So they have this inside the frame scoring system they go by to, to, to whether they are, they you know should have a should have a drop or not. And that was the second highest rate at 10% of any tight end who who had uh, a certain playing threshold. I think it was 20% of the minimum uh, of the sorry the average targets in the league. So uh, that's pretty bad. There are 42 tight ends in the category he was second to last. So obviously not what you want. It's a relatively small total number, but it's definitely an area where he needs to improve his play. Yeah, absolutely. And you you have to imagine this. I mean, Lamar is by far the best quarterback he's ever played with. He's probably had the strongest arm adjusting to, you know, the velocity that Lamar throws to, to whatever quarterback he had in college, plus, you know, the speed of the game. It, that's something to address. It, you know, it takes some adjusting to and, you're going to have those drops. And it, I've, I think, again, like all of these things are correctable um, with, you know, just through more experience and better, you know, more coaching. Yeah. I just getting used to the speed of the game is something that I think we already kind of saw some of that happening in the last season. We certainly saw him have a big playoff game. We saw him have big moments at mid season that we've talked about. Um, you know, then he's getting used to another quarterback in terms of, of Huntley, uh, you know, dealing with a game on injury, but uh, you know, I, I I find it difficult for people to believe that they'd be pessimistic about 2023 based on the way he played down the stretch. And you know what? The other thing I really have to put a high value on is it, it's an oddball offense, even for a tight end. Even though it's tight end centric, there's no tight end who's who's played in a Roman type offense very often because they don't they are played at the NFL level and even in college they 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 play a much more wide open style typically uh running out of 11 personnel is more common uh you do have a little bit more fullback use i suppose in college but it's really not hyper prevalent anymore uh it, it's just a it's a very odd offense it's one that it that a it rookie tight end you'd expect him to struggle a little bit with yeah absolutely and it, it, oh, it, a lot of rookie tight ends, you know, no matter the scheme, struggle in their first year. Um, you know, it's a lot that you're putting on them because you're asking them to be key in the run game. You're asking them to be, you know, weapons in the pass game, and it's it, it it's a lot. They they they're learning routes. They're you know they're probably running routes that they may may or may not have run in college, and it it it, it can just be a lot for any tight end to adjust to the pro game. All right. So let's look forward to 2023 here because Charlie Kolar was obviously was inactive pretty much the whole season. He came back, he played the last week in Cincinnati. He looked terrific. Um, And he will be one of two major competitors for likely this season for playing time. So the first is, you know, neither of them is going to get Mark Andrews snaps or, 
you know, maybe Mark Andrews plays a few less snaps and each of them gets some, but it won't be much from there, just a trickle. Uh, but the other major contributor, sorry, uh, competitor for snap time is 11 personnel. If the Ravens go to 11 personnel, then it's probably Andrews is on the field or it's Andrews and one of the guys, which means they're all dealing with snaps out of an eyedropper, as I call it, that are going to you know, be reduced for all tight ends. Um, but if they're going to you know, run a fair amount of 11 personnel this year, it, it has to cut in, I would think, at a likely playing time. Right, exactly. Like um, it, just w- from all of the wide receivers that they've added, um, I th- I'm I'm hoping to see you know uh, likely's targets will probably either flat or you know possibly go down. Hopefully they'll go up a little bit, but I, I think it's totally possible that uh, these you know the the eleven personnel when you're you know when you're paying Odell fifteen million dollars and you're you're you're, you're he's going to get snaps at least at the beginning of the season to see how good you know how good he can play. And then you have Bateman and you have Flowers. It, it, there, there, there's investments there that people want to see paid off. There, there certainly are investments. And boy, I tell you what, I, I, I don't know how to ask this as a question properly. So I'll do, I'll do my best without trying to color it in some way that, that'll you know make it obvious how I feel about it. But do you think the Ravens look at the 18 million they're paying or 15 to 18 million? Cause there's kind of some con- incentive based things there. And by the way, they might really want to get out of that 3 million if they can, but so that might actually be a consideration for this year. But do you think they look at that money that is spent on Beckham and say, we really have to consider that as money spent on Lamar, but in either case it's sunk. He won't be with us in 2024. This is a prove it year for him in a case. And so it doesn't really matter to us if he plays well or if likely takes snaps from him and ends up being a guy that Lamar can trust and the offense works with. Um, how do you think the Ravens are looking at giving Odell playing time relative to his contract size? Um, boy, yeah, that's a good question. I, w- I would say likely would have to supremely outperform him in practice and in well Odell's not going to play in the preseason but mm-hmm. it like likely would have to be head and heels over, better a better target than Odell is he have to have more trust uh Lamar would have to have more trust in likely than Odell um in order for them to at least start the season as likely getting more snaps and more targets than Odell. I um, completely agree with that, by the way, that they're going to give Odell the first chance. Right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, I, and, and as the season goes on, I, I think it's going to be who, you know, what, what's the best, uh, what's the best matchup? What's the best, per, best personnel setting? Um, like if, if Odell isn't performing up to well, up, up to, you know, his contract or even performing well in the offense, I think Harbaugh has no, no real problems of, you know, reducing snaps of um, players like that. Like uh, think back to Ngakwe um, when the, Raven, the Ravens traded for him, we saw his snaps reduced as, you know, as he wasn't as effective as a pass rusher as, you know, we all probably had hoped he would be. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a you know a, a fair a comment there certainly. And I, I I look at these two players maybe in a different sense, and I'm trying to figure out what is it that Odell Beckham is much better than Isaiah Likely as as a receiver. So let's let's start with the things in terms of a, a yards per target receiver. I think it's very much up in the air who's the more likely, more dangerous threat this season more likely to be the more dangerous that always dangerous when you have Isaiah likely you're talking about that you get likely to come up in the world or unlikely but in any case that's that's been Beckham's problem in recent years is a sharply declining yards per target a inability to be dangerous after the catch a always always been a good technical route runner since his first year it's always been what what about his game has been really special and by the way I think there's a lot of things he can teach not only other wide receivers in Baltimore, but hopefully the tight ends in Baltimore as well, in terms of um, giving a little wiggle, giving a little shake to that defensive back at the top of the step. Yeah. Um, I, I, 
I would I would say I'm I'm a little bit more optimistic on Odell um, mm-hmm. than maybe what you you sound like you are. Um, I I think what we saw from Odell, um, not just in the Super Bowl, but in the playoff playoff run with the Rams, mm-hmm. he was. I mean, he was a pretty high. I mean, he had a very solid uh, playoff run there. Um, I mean, I, I think even his yards per target were up around ten for the for those three or four games that they were in the playoffs. So um, he's he he looked like a, a viable weapon um, before he got injured, and obviously in that Super Bowl game. So it it the big question is what. Uh, what Odell are we getting? Like if, if we could get the guy that was in that playoffs, um, we have a really solid receiver, even if he's, you know, a year removed from that knee injury. But um, I guess we'll, we'll all see how, how good he is. I think, you know, as far as what he could do better than likely is, you know, being a threat at, you know, yards after catch um, and being, being able to get open against, you know, other cornerbacks, uh, you know, if, if we, if likely has a tougher, you know, linebacker or safety matchup, you, maybe they have a weaker cornerback and Odell could, you know, exploit that. But yeah, they, they, I, but yeah, like, um, I, I, it's, it's an, it's an interesting, it's, it's an interesting dilemma to have though. Okay. So it's, I, I would agree with you by the way, that he's, he was two different players in 2021. Of course, the unfortunate thing is he's a year removed from that because he, he lost yeah. all of last year due to injury. Um, there is a very damning decline in his yards per target over time, but he was 11, over 11 in that playoff run and a not insignificant number of targets at, at 26. So he caught 21 out of 26 balls for 288. That's that's enough to be excited, I suppose, to, and has to play in significantly into the re- reason the Ravens ended up signing him. Uh, that said, I struggle to believe that he's recovered to anything like that level, um, and, and in particular that we could expect it going forward after another year off. Yeah, I I, I agree. <laughs> it, it you know it's I'd love to see it. I and I mean um, you know. I think all the reports around the NFL was when he had that workout for all the teams. They said he, he's back to what he was before. Um, and I, I guess you have to take take a, take words a little bit. And I think yeah. you know I, that's going to be one of those things I'm watching at training camp every 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 time I get out there is you know seeing how he looks. Yeah. Right. He, he, the, the problem is before what is what you really need to get to, because he, his his best season as a pro is his rookie year when he had 10.0 yards per target. If you just look at you know what happened since then, 9.2, 8.1, 7.4, 8.5, 7.8, 7.4, 6.5. That is a ski slope of production and then zero or you know none undefined last year with uh, with uh, with out for the whole season. That is a ski slope level. Um, and it's it's just really hard for me to project Odell as as anywhere near the first target for the Ravens. And I hope you know he can he can be a if he could come in and be what um, Houston has been to the defense, be a specialist, pick up first downs when they're needed um, on, on third down, uh, be a mentor to the other players at both positions. I don't know if that's in him. It's 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 right there. Justin Houston, very comfortable with that. Looks like he might coach after he leaves ball. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about Beckham. I'm not sure if he's he's going to be that guy for the Ravens. Yeah. From from what I've heard, that's exactly who he's been his whole career. Fantastic. Um, all, all of his teammates have all, all have, you know, praised him and, you know, the receivers, he's taken receivers under their wing, t- taught them, you know, he's had them over to his house and, you know, taught them, watch film with them. So it sounds like he's a great teammate. And I think that there's some value. There's definitely some value in that. I don't know I, if it's 15 million, but. <laughs> I could completely agree there. I mean, if, if, if he delivers on that, he's worth a lot if, if for that alone. And, you know, what we're seeing in this off season, you know, it's honestly very encouraging to see him, out there on the field with Zay Flowers and Lamar, uh, taking time together. It's, first of all, just to see those three together is a very positive thing. 
just to see that yeah. the, the three of them are, are out there and, uh, and, and spending their own time doing that is good. You know, obviously I'm not as happy that Odell is missing minicamp. Um, I think that that's something where, um, you know, it's not required. Players can make their own choices. You know, there's certainly been players from the Ravens past who have not uh, always participated in it, like Ray Lewis. But, uh, but you, know, you also kind of hope that he'd be there for, for something like that to just uh, uh, maybe, if nothing else, make some connections with the other players on the team. Sure, yeah. Um, it's, yeah. I think, you know, uh, different veterans get themselves ready for the season different ways. Um, it's, I, I, I would like to have seen him here more learning a new offense, um, even though he's, you know, he's worked with Munkin before. Um, you know, developing that relationship with Lamar would have been nice. Um, but it, they're also apparently down in Florida working hard, uh, training together right now as we speak. So that's also something to be encouraged about. Yeah, it's great to hear. And if, if, if I, I, I really hope, you know, that I'm wrong about who Odell, Odell Buckham is this year and that he, you know, earns the full three million in, in incentives in terms of uh, uh, yardage and playing time and whatever else they've, they've, they've got tied up in that. Um, but I, I will believe it as I see it. I'll say that I won't, I'm not wedded to the position as, as this changes. I, I, people have seen me on other players. Juan Edwards comes to mind as a guy that I was very down on and he turned it around and it would, you know, that wasn't hard to, to get on board with. Um, there's been other players, you know, in Ravens history, certainly fall into that same category in terms of, pr- of producing at a higher level than, than expectation. Um, I just, you know, We've we've seen this movie before, in terms of a guy who's had um, you know an older receiver who comes to the Ravens with big expectations, and sometimes it has a happy ending if we're looking at Anquan Bolden, and sometimes it doesn't. If we're looking at any number of other guys, start with the, the, the Cardinals receiver Frank Sanders that I have a hard time remembering his name sometimes, but uh, many others. All right, let's let's move on here because I want to get back to Likely and and talk about where you'd see him. You mentioned that you could see his targets dropping. I think I would say it's probably unlikely that he gets to 60 targets again without injury playing a fairly significant role in that. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, I've, you know, part of the reason why he got so many targets was the Ravens were, had so little um, depth at wide receiver. So just the fact that, you, you know, they've brought in Beckham, they've drafted flowers, Bateman's coming back and hopefully, you know, he can be here for an entire season and you still have Andrews. That's a lot of, you know, that's a lot more uh, mouths to feed. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to see it at least get to back to 60 targets, but it's, I I would guess more than likely it's going to go down. I would I would agree with that too, and you know in a way it's good. I, I, a lot of the receivers who are getting targets for the Ravens need fewer, and they need fewer targets that are on the margin. Specifically, Andrews really suffering from that uh, is has been my theory. Is that you know at 100, I think it was 113 targets he had last year, but the the last 20 of those that are probably bailout ta- targets are really dangerous throws made by Lamar in and Huntley for that matter in, in difficult situations where they're hoping, you know, Andrews can bail them out of a bad situation in a one-on-one matchup sometimes, and sometimes worse where, you know, there's a one-on-one with a loose bracket behind that where a lot can go wrong uh, in terms of the ball getting picked off. And we've seen a, a lot of that happen to Andrews in recent years where there's a lot of interceptions on balls thrown to him. Uh, and it's it's this multiple coverage focus that is that is what's really getting him um, in these situations. And I think the, the big thing for the Ravens this year will be if Lamar can spread the ball out effectively, those marginal targets to each receiver will be reduced. You won't have as many deep balls to Marlon Brown or another one where there are a lot of deep overthrows to Marlon Brown. So his catch rate never really looked that good on long balls um, because Lamar was he, he was overthrowing or overthrowing the defender intentionally so that the uh, uh, you know Marquise Brown also had less of a chance at the football uh, not I mean you know Marquise Brown is a smaller guy also I don't want to get too much into the detail on that the marginal targets anyway for both of those receivers Andrews and Brown were hurting their overall statistics and I think that with a monk and offense where hopefully it's a multiple read offense for Jackson 
um, there's a there's a better chance of him spreading the ball out to more receivers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I I agree with you. Like part of one of my notes on on what a good season is is doing doing more with less is um, you know quality uh, targets over quantity and. Let's jump jump right into it. So, <laughs> so the way we've been doing this is you do your good. I'll, I'll say how I would adjust your good or, or add some minor twist to your good. And then you do great and I'll do great all, uh, after that. So your, your good season is what, what is it? Okay. Yeah. So a fir- a first um, is obviously uh, hold off Charlie Kolar and be the top uh, tight end backup. Um, you know, Kolar was the higher draft pick. Um, you know, it's going to be a competition between the two of them. And uh, likely just needs to make sure he, you know, secures himself as the top uh, number two tight end behind Andrews. Um, and also continue development as a blocker and pass catcher. But, um, uh, you know, like I was saying, um, you know, you want to concentrate on uh, quality targets as opposed to quantity. And it at least reach that uh, eight yards per target mark, um, even if it ends up being right around. 50 or 55 targets for, for the season. Um, I, I think that would be a good improvement. But I think the most important thing that he could do um, is make the uh, 12 personnel be a, the major reason why the 12 personnel is the most efficient um, personnel grouping for the offense. And um, it, like those are, you know, him being a big red, red zone target um, and just you know, making making the the twelve personnel the 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 most efficient one was the I think the biggest thing that would be a good season for him. Okay, I I, I really like yours for for starters. So you got a couple things in there that I really like. First of all, if he's the reason twelve personnel is what really clicks for this offense, then that's fantastic. That's that's probably the best reason I've heard. I, to me, I don't, I I almost think he doesn't really have to beat out Kolar. He just has to be super productive in what opportunities he gets. And I think the opportunities will come, whether they're, they're he beats Kolar out of snaps, he gets them because Andrews is hurt. Ricard all of a sudden is not the same player and, and they need to use more of a of a uh, flex or move tight end to uh, get value on the field. I think all of those things are possible. Um, but here's, here, here's what I actually wrote is run blocking continues at a similar level or even a small step back. I think he was so good that he could take a small step back as a run blocker and still be okay improves his drop rate and makes better use of space between level two and three with better overall efficiency. My, my target and your, your target was eight minus 7.5 for, for improvement. If he's at 6.2, 6.4, whatever it was this year, that's a fairly significant improvement. And he's going to have to have some, some improvements to yak to get there. He's also going to have some improvements to drop rate to get there. He's also going to have to probably have some decrease in marginal targets to help get him there. But Whatever combination gets you there, winning two of those three, say, uh, to pick up an extra yard per target, I think would be terrific. Um, you know, a couple breakaway plays would, you know, would obviously be part of that from a yak perspective. But I, w- I would say if he could do that in in between forty five and sixty targets, so sixty is what he had last year. If he could do it at, at least seventy five percent of the targets he had last year, I'd be pretty happy with that. And if let's toss that in there, fifty five targets at seven point five yards per target, let's say is 412 receiving yards that I think he had 375 or thereabouts last year during the regular season. I I think that could really be contributory to the 23 Ravens. How are, how would you feel about that? If, if all of this thing increased efficiency leads to a, you know, a 400 yard season. Yeah. I, I mean, I think he's definitely making an impact on the, on the team. Um, especially if those can be, you know, more high, high leverage, uh, downs like red zone targets and third down catches to move the chains Good uh, point. You know, yeah those th- that's exactly what you want from them um and you know you, you can't expect them to be you know a, a big 700 800 yard tight end you know with with andrews there and with the receivers that they have but he, I, something like that is definitely a uh an impact on the team Okay, let's move on. What do you? What is a great season in your mind for Isaiah Likely? Okay, I would say um, establish himself as a top uh, three or possibly four uh, pass catching weapon in the offense. Um, I, I I would highly doubt he's going to surpass Andrews, um, 
and I would hope uh, Bateman is, you know, at least the number two option. But if he could be that number three, um, you know, be be surpass Beckham, you know, maybe hold off on Flowers or if anybody else emerges, um, him being a top three or four weapon in the offense it would be, you know, a, a really good, uh, good start to the season. Um, and getting, um, eight, I, I would say if, if he could get to 80 to 80, 80 to 90 targets in the system where they do a lot more, just two tight end sets and, um, looks a lot more like the Georgia offense when they had the two tight ends that were running all over the field, making plays, um, and him getting to, you know, even above that eight yards per target metric would be, um, you know, a, a really great season and really, you know, you know, to build off, you know, 12 personnel, make the 12 personnel be preferred and the number one go to base, uh, base uh, uh, grouping for the offense if, uh, is, you know, I, I think that would be a great season for him. Okay. I, I, I really like that. I think you laid it out there very well. I've got maybe a t- slightly different spin on it for that's different. I, I, I want him to take a large leap as a receiver. And you said become one of the top three or four receiving weapons, but that's essentially, I think, what I've got here. Such that he schemed more as the first or second read on individual plays. So that's that's what I want to see. Obviously, the Ravens are going to going to try and um, distribute the ball better, I think, under Monken. I think that's going to be part of the plan. And I think it's it's going to be – there will be some Lamar making choices, but there should also be some schemed plays where he's got read one, read two, and hopefully can quickly make his decision between those two. And, and if, for likely to get a lot of those throws, he really has to be number one or number two. He, he can't always be a bailout target. He can't always be the guy Lamar looks for because he just won't be. I mean, Andrews will be that guy still a lot. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, Flowers or Bateman could be that guy. I think, you know, there's there's too many other options in terms of who could be the the, the guy who bails him out on extended plays. So I, I, I think you're, you're right about that. And I've just said it a slightly different way. I want fewer drops and I want more yak. He didn't have a catch, I think, over 34 yards this last season. I, I definitely want to see some more breakaway plays, which that'll, that will help build his yak a lot. The fewer drops actually – it won't make that much of a difference because if he were to cut his drop rate in half, which is about what might be reasonable to expect, he'll only cut himself from four to two drops, which when you think about it is, you know, an extra, what, 15 yards for the year, or whatever he's going to get out of that. And that's not the, that's not the biggest number um, that you'll see. Uh, he, I want him to, at 8.5 yards per target. The Ravens with their tight ends have been able to do that in some years recently, particularly with Andrews, even with some disadvantaged targets. So I think 8.5 on a second tight end is not unrealistic, and I think that would be uh, very good. And then the biggest thing I'd say is going into 2024, I hope likely is one of the players who is a mitigating factor, and they by the end of the year they feel this way, to the projected losses they'll have of Beckham and Aguilar to start with, but both neither of those guys are going to be here in 24. They both got uh, void year contracts, which are which force them to basically leave town or or be resigned again. Which I, I think either it, 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 it's very unlikely that they'd be back with the Ravens in 24. So the Ravens will be looking for additional answers at receiver, and I'm hoping that an emergence of likely in a year like this. And I don't think it has to be a big increase in targets. Would um, uh, mean that he uh, he is part of the solution to that problem. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I also had one more thing um, is uh, when when teams are focused on Mark Andrews, like they're over focused double team. I'd I'd love to see likely be the guy that makes teams pay in one on one coverage against you know a lesser coverage guy, and you know make teams pay for double teaming Mark Andrews. And so, yeah. yeah. That, that boy, we better see that across the offense. If you're going to, I mean, the whole value of spreading the ball out comes from obviously deciding where is the defense expending their resources? What's the safety breaking on uh, in, mm-hmm. in terms of an individual route and then throw opposite that. If, if the Ravens can't do that with Monken, I think that it will be a pretty big strike one towards him as an offensive coordinator. And I, I, I don't want to say that because I'm very optimistic about what will happen in 23 in terms of these weapons and what scheme he can bring to the table. Because 
all the things he said talk about how you're challenging for every blade of grass, every inch of space on the field. You make the, if the, the offense is balanced if you're forcing the defense to defend everywhere at once and they just can't do it. Um, that's, that's exactly the right attitude. He's got to actually just put, be able to have Lamar um, implement that <laughs> in a way that, that, that actually works. So uh, hopefully that works out. And by the way, I think he could do everything I said and have – at or a little bit below 700 yards for a great season still. And I think you're, you're indicating that too. If you got to 80 targets at say eight and a half, well, that'd be 680 right there. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. You want to move on and talk about Rocky Sin a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Rocky Sin, he was a uh, second round pick from the Colts out of, uh, back in 2019 a um, little bit of a bigger corner. He's uh, six feet tall. Um, I would say he is the definition of an average starting NFL corner. Um, he uh, is solid in man coverage, solid in corner, and, and I'm sorry, in zone coverage. Um, is not spectacular in either. Um, when he is matched up against, you, you know, he can have very good games. He can have very poor games as well. And, um, you know, I think, uh, he's, I, I, I would just say he's, he's the definition of an average starting corner in the league. Well, they're, they are paying him a lot of money, but he's got a bunch of void years after the first year. So it's another case where they'll have to figure out how to do a, make another contract out of this. I think it's about three point six million for one year is what his contract ends up being. Let me confirm that for a second. Now it's about four million for one year um, is is what they're paying him. Very physical corner. Uh, he comes to Ravens at age twenty seven, so it's a good age to get a corner for. You don't you don't ideally you wouldn't be buying into a 31, 32 year old corner where you weren't pretty sure about what you had. And of course, that's exactly what the Ravens' other major option was. It was talked about all season is bringing Marcus Peters back. I personally don't feel like one excludes the others, but Yasin is the absolute antithesis of Marcus Peters as a cornerback, or to me at least he is. Um, Marcus Peters, a back end, cover three, predator, ball hawk. Uh, you know, he's looking to come up and make a play on the football. Rock Yasin, a physical, uh, you know, point of the catch contester. Also contest space kind of well. If you can get back to some bigger corners like Ike Taylor and Jimmy Smith and what they were able to do, uh, maybe even Ike Taylor more, um, but with very limited ball skills. Um, he's had only, I think it's 27 passes defense in a four-year career that spans 1,728 coverage snaps and only two interceptions. So he's not a guy who is regularly figuring out where the football is. It's more like he tries to figure out the catch point and get really physical with the receiver at that point. All right. Yeah, I, I I joke that Yasin is he is the guy that uh you know gives gives defensive backs bad reputations that they are wide receivers that can't catch because he, he's he's broken on some balls and should have had, had several just easy interceptions and the ball goes right through his hands hits him on the face mask or you know he just straight drops the ball so yeah he's he he is not the ball hawk that Marcus Peters was. And, um, you know, which which I was a little surprised about why why they chose to go that way is usually when you have one, uh, you know, solid cover corner, you want to get a ball hawk on the other side. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we have Marlon, uh, you know, as as a cover corner and, you know, you can afford to take more risk with the with that other cornerback. And, you know, Peters, you know, Peters and him had that great connection and they, you know, they they were a great match together. And Yasin, he's, you know, he, he, he's more of a physical cornerback, like you said, but does not have those, those ball skills to get it to, you know, force turnovers. Yeah. It's, it's, that's a great point by the way. And it was, it was, it was so perfect for Peters to come into the situation in 2019 when he really struggled the first half of the season over in LA, come back and become a pro bowler right away. You know, actually, not even a pro, but all up, all pro, right, all right pro. away in yeah. 2019, mm-hmm. and uh, the reversal of that season just shows how how much the right player in the right system can really benefit. So Ravens were a very aggressive blitzing team under Wink Martindale, and Peters knew exactly how to take advantage of that. 
Yassin does not seem like the kind of cornerback that makes a defense, sorry, an offense pay for being put in high pressure situations in the backfield. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like, um, I, I think he kind of needs to be ready to be what I call the mark is the guy that's going to yeah. get all the targets, you know, especially in high leverage situations. Um, they're not going to attack Marlin, I guess, depending on, you know, what happens at slot cornerback, if it ends up being Hamilton or somebody else, mm-hmm. um, it, he needs to be prepared to be the guy that they're going after, you know, in a lot of uh, high leverage situations. Like, um, I think a couple of years ago, um, Anthony Avery had had a game where I've, I think it was, I think it might've been against the Bengals where he had like 10 or 15 targets against them. Um, and you know, they continually went at him, went at him, and he and he held up very, very well. They, you know, they got a couple of plays on him, but he made also, you know, a lot of plays. So they weren't efficient going to him, but they did were able to make some plays against him. And I think he needs to be prepared to get a lot of balls thrown his way. I got to look back at that Everett game. I've, I I have a, a vague recollection of it, but I but I can't exactly. You know, that's one of the interesting thing about Yassin that I noticed, which is is very surprising to me, is in his four years with with Oakland and then at, I'm sorry with Las Vegas and previously with the Colts, um, his his coverage has actually improved each season um, in in a lot of ways. And and the, the primary one that I look at is what is the passer rating against him. And the other thing you notice is that he's doing it in less targets year over year. So um, you know, it's not like they throw at him all the time, but he said that the 56, 63, 46, and 53 targets in four seasons, um, he's been thrown at 218 times out of, out of 12, I guess this coverage snaps is the best one to use, 1,728. That's not too high a percentage. It's not the kind of guy that screams out, you know, throw at me, throw at me. And it particularly is another kind of guy who screams that out when the Ravens are, are playing a committed nickel and will have Queen and Roquan on the field, presumably on third down. You know, you got some options to throw against the inside linebacker if you don't like what you have on the outside. Um, so I don't think he necessarily weakens the, the team in, in that respect. I think that we, there might that might actually be something that the Ravens like about him. They said that this is a guy who didn't get thrown at even in a – um, he was pretty average in terms of his play. And even when other, uh, the defense, the rest of the defense around him wasn't that great, whether you, it was, we're talking about the pass rush, whether you're talking about, you know, the play at linebacker, the, but, but he still wasn't getting really picked on in that situation. Now, maybe you should expect that because an average player is going to get picked on. But the other thing that happens a lot is you roll your safeties off your number one corner who you think you can trust and allow him to play on an Island a little bit. And, and Yassin, even, when that was done to the degree it was done, you know, didn't give up a ton of targets or a really terrible quarterback rating. That's actually improved each year for him, which is, which is, that's uh, at least as a reason in my mind for optimism. Oh yeah. Well, I, I think it's also, you know, very good considering, you know, he doesn't get many interceptions that is passer rating against keeps going uh, down because, you know, the biggest thing to hurt a passer rating is interceptions. And if he's not getting them, that's something to be opt- kind of optimistic about. Yeah, great point. And just his his passer rating over the four years, just to give you an idea, 101.4, 105 in his second year, 93.4, and then 82.5. And with his coverage improvements that have happened, um, oftentimes what you'll see is a very grabby cornerback and a particularly a physical guy like Yassin. You'd expect his penalty numbers to be higher than they have, but he's only, he's only been flagged seven times the last two years combined. And I think that's pretty damn good for a, a an in-your-face physical corner. Doesn't always play press or anything, but he can. Um, you know, depends on that mirror and probably some contact at the top of the stem to to kind of throw the, the throw the timing off. Um, it, it just I I think it's more typical if a guy is leaving himself out there to be beat either at the line of scrimmage or at the top of the route that that those guys end up getting grabby. Um, Yassin is not a guy with, with outstanding makeup speed. So he'd be a guy that, that I would have thought, you know, probably would have been penalized a lot more. You know, we saw Brandon Stevens, for example, get really grabby when things were not going right 
last year. And there's other players too. It's not, I don't want to pick on Brandon. There's lots of players who fall into that category. Um, Christmas McAllister, 2006, by the way, still a pretty damn good cornerback, or people thought so in his eighth season. Penalized 15 times that year. 15 times wow. on a defense yeah. that had 56 sacks, I think, 56 or 60. I can't remember which one is the big year, that or 2014. But uh, it, it just, it, I, I don't know how you do that at corner, um, but, yeah, but he managed. That's, that's rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, let's talk about some other things in terms of, of how the Ravens deploy him. Now I want to talk about one other, I want to talk about one other weakness before we get into deployment. <laughs> The reason for optimism, obviously, his 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 quarterback rating against and his generally his coverage skills have improved as he's learned to, I think, make do with who he is a, as a player in four years. What has gotten worse is his tackle rate. He's missed a ton of tackles the last two years in particular. And he had a combined 18.3% missed tackle rate the last two years. I think that's on like 17 misses. So it's not a small number. Um, make sure of that. Yeah, PFF hasn't for 17 misses anyway. So that's that's to, to me that's one of the real problems. It's very difficult to put a guy on an island if he's going to get a beat at the end of that play after the catch over a missed tackle. It's just not something, not a good combination. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I think that's something you know playing for the Ravens. It, missed tackles is not something that's acceptable. Um, so hopefully that's something that will be emphasized and you know just the the general culture of the Ravens, you know, doesn't allow for, you know, to be a poor tackler and, and to be a physical corner and, and be a physical presence was something that, you know, Marlon will definitely, I think as a leader will definitely uh, harp, harp on him and, and get on him about because, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, it's a great point. And I have, I have some of that later, but why don't we talk about it now since, since it's, it's, it's where you are. Something about Yasin, and there's other guys, by the way, on the Ravens defense who I think fall in this category who don't, we don't know exactly who they are right now. Another one, Caillou Bukele, got no idea. Um, he was not on my top 18 or so cornerbacks in the draft. The Ravens took him. They obviously see something about him they like. His statistics in college in terms of yards per target are terrible, absolutely terrible. Uh, so you you can you can point to the fact that he's playing in a defense that probably overstretched him because they were so bad. But on the other hand, you know, I, I it's it's rare to see a guy with target you know yards per target numbers as bad as he had that goes in the draft and and is really thought of to be a top corner. And I I know there must be physical things they like, but this, we look the best example is Roquan Smith last year. Now Roquan Smith, as much as we love him. He was not an all pro level player at Chicago. He had a lot of weaknesses as a player that seemed to get expunged. Now, he's got tremendous strengths as well, but he had a bunch of weaknesses in his game that all of a sudden he's playing for the Ravens. And, and you're like, after you've watched a bunch of film when he gets acquired, and then you see this other guy on the field <laughs> once he's there. I mean, it's not like there aren't similarities, but. But uh, you know, just a just a, a far better player. Uh, you know, realized what he needed to do in the Ravens defense was very comfortable in that. And I wonder if Yasin is a guy who can come into this scheme, who the Ravens have it figured out in terms of who they want him to be within their scheme, that will really be able to to outperform expectation. One thing I've always given a lot of credit for John Harbaugh uh, for doing is they they've always been very good at finding a player's strengths and you know adjusting their scheme to their strengths and kind of cover up weaknesses of players um so i mean we've seen a lot of players that you know were either marginal talents or average talents play a lot better um with us than they have you know with other teams either before they came here or after or you know after they left um just because the Ravens are just really good at finding, you know, fi- finding a player's strength and just, you know, adjusting to their strengths and, you know, not doing too much to hurt, hurt a player. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I would agree with that. And, and you know, Peters is the other guy, obviously, you know, in terms of recent years who came right in. You look at Josh Bynes at LG Fort in terms of what they provided for, for this defense, I think you get a lot of a, a lot to back up what you just mentioned in terms of them really playing to the strengths of their players and, uh, and, and making that work. So let's talk about how the Ravens are going to deploy rock in this next year. So 
uh, as of right now, the cornerback depth is so, so, so flimsy on this team. I think he's fairly obviously he's got to be the starting left corner from where he is. He's played left corner most of his career. Um, obviously, Humphrey's played all over, left corner, right corner, and slot, but probably his, his best year is probably at right corner, excuse me, playing opposite uh, uh, Peters um, in, in, in those years. I would think it's a it's a fairly natural left corner right corner deal uh, with Yasin and Humphrey respectively. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, we we have a lot of numbers at cornerback. Um, I don't think we have established um, established depth or established quality depth. Um, yeah. I would say um, yeah, all all the cornerbacks um, behind Yasin have, you know, shown some imp- like I, I would say Stevens has shown some improvement. Um, Although I would not trust him in a you know in a major role on the defense, um, and uh, Armor Davis, you know he really struggled in uh, when when he got his chance. Um, Pepe had his you know had had you know showed some, but also struggled some as well. Um, and then you know you with uh, Blue Kelly, I mean he's a rookie in what a fourth round or fifth round pick. I can't remember exactly which one. But yep. okay, fifth round pick. So, it, it you can't expect him to be you know on the on the field contributing much as a rookie in that respect. You know, every time I go over this cornerback list, you know it, Trayvon Mullen is there, and you know related to Lamar, who knows you know if he if he might see some playing time. Daryl Worley is a guy who's seen a fair amount of NFL playing time. The Ravens bent over backwards to keep him on the roster all last year with those eighteen or so transactions. Of him, but they obviously, you know, you, you don't. If you don't really care about the guy, if you don't see him as part of your long term future, you probably don't make eighteen transactions involving him to try and bring him back time after time. I think they just had an idea that that he was going to pass through, and yet right now it looks to me like he's the Ravens' number three cornerback. I don't see another guy who's better than him. I, you know, I I, I think JAD. Uh, is a developmental player at this time. You know, he did come out of Alabama with very few total career games at corner. So there wasn't a whole lot there to, to look at. You, you've got uh, uh, Mullen, who may or may not make the team. I think he's 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 got a chance, but he also could end up on the practice squad It's not the, or, or cut and picked up by another team. Um, you know, it, it, Stevens is, they're talking about moving to safety, which I think is really premature. I think he could be the Ravens number three cornerback otherwise, because I think at the end of the last year, he played fairly well down the stretch the grabbiness he kind of worked out of his game and and you know i wouldn't i still don't want him on the field at outside corner but i think outside corner is probably the position where he can develop to play um the problem with stevens is we need to stop talking about development this is year three for him he needs to show what he, what he's got the ravens need to figure out what they have with him because the option value is is running out of that hourglass pretty quickly Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like, um, I, yeah, he played well better as a corner, um, outside. And I, I was, I was hoping that they would keep him in that position, but it's sounding like, you know, he's, he's playing more safety. So yeah, hope, hopefully, yeah, hopefully they move him back to corner or, or, you know, give him give him a real shot. It's, it, it's really hard and it's gotta be hard on him just as a player to go from, corner to safety back yes. to corner and and doing all of that is it like, like he 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 doesn't get a chance to really learn at any one position and so it, that's really hard i mean c- completely agree i mean it, that's the camelai correa effect and, and so you know he, he was a guy who moved inside linebacker outside linebacker and and you know never really um quote unquote got a chance I mean, his mother wrote some comments on <laughs> things I wrote about Correa that were just terrible. <laughs> I, I hope that wasn't him, but but I think it was his uh, his mother saying, you know, he, he, you just don't understand. He should be playing outside linebacker where he dominates and whatnot. It's just, a, I'm sure he was not <laughs> really amused yeah. by the fact that those things were written. In any case, yeah. uh, it, it's uh, uh, I don't think we can continue or finish the discussion of Rocky Asin without talking about Marcus Peters. And first of all, does one preclude the other? I, I don't really feel so. So I'll set that up, and I'll, but I'll ask a second question at the same time: Is you got a difference in age and a tr- difference in trajectory of play? So Peters is about four years older than Yasin, if I recall correctly. It might be three and a half, but it's but it's in that neighborhood. Um, I guess one of the questions I ask is: since it's only a one-year deal for Yasin at four million dollars, 
who would you really have rather have for 2023 only? <sighs> At the same I, price I for think, starters, because yeah, yeah, sure. I honestly like. I would be happy if they re-sign Peters and, you know, just figure out, um, you know, Yesen and Peters, you know, on one side, you know, on the outside and just figure it out. Like if, if nothing else, you know, it gives them, but it gives them depth. Um, I would, I would say just by their styles of play, if I had to choose either, or I would probably pick Peters um, mm-hmm. just because you, you have that, cover guy in Marlin, get another guy on the outside that can, you know, make a defense pay, jump a route um, when they're going after him and make a defense pay with, with some turnovers. Like I also, I, I can't remember the guy's name, the cornerback at, that went to the, to Washington. That was Mal- just or, sorry, not Malcolm. Ball help. I want to call him Malcolm Forbes, but it's uh it's uh Emmanuel, it's Emmanuel Forbes. Emmanuel Forbes. Forbes. Yeah. Yes, I loved yes. him. Oh man. I loved yeah. him. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That, that like that's the kind of corner I'd I'd would want to see opposite of Marlin. Um is is a guy that's gonna make a defense pay with, with some turnovers. And Yasin, I mean, he's been a solid player, he but he's not that turnover guy. Um like you said, he's got two career interceptions for for in four years. So yeah, Forbes, it would have been really interesting to see how it would have gone down at twenty two if Forbes were still on the board. I thought there was probably some over optimism that he would even make it through to that point. And one of the reasons was I, I wasn't really all that high about Gonzalez. And to be honest, if you put the gun to my head, I still would have said Gonzalez over Forbes, just because there's a lot of raw attributes there to work with a lot of raw size with Gonzalez, but Gonzalez has the Caillou blue Kelly problem that his statistics in his final year in college are not very good. Gave up a lot of yards per target, despite, you know, some interceptions and whatnot. Malcolm Forbes, it's just anytime the ball is thrown in his area, it's interception. And, and a lot of the time it's a pick six. And the guy's big knock on him was his undersizedness at, I think, 166 at the combine, which yeah. is probably a running weight when we get right down right. to it. Is he, he came to get there. But if you watch him play, I mean, the guy is a fighter, a tooth and nail fighter when playing downhill um, and really gets after a, a, a ball carrier. So. Uh, right. Anyway, I, I thought he'd have been a, a fantastic addition. I think the Ravens loved him too, and they really thought they might have a chance at him. And I bet I, I something just tells me that they might have taken Forbes over Flowers at twenty-two, despite all the potential Lamar fallout that that might have been part of that. Yeah, I, I really liked Forbes too. Um, he he reminded me of uh, an older cornerback, D'Angelo Hall, uh, when yeah. he was at his best. Just a smaller guy but a fighter and you know was also a ball hawk as well so i you know i, I think he played he hall played for washington so maybe yep. you know he reminded him of yeah him could certainly so be that it, it, to me d'angelo hall you know certainly didn't have a bad career by by any stretch but i think that's almost about the bottom of what you can expect from a player like forbes he's i mean first round talent for so the pedigree is all there for forbes it's not like he's some fraud that you hope is going to work out he's done everything in college at, a, at an extraordinarily high level including mm-hmm. the one stat i love is if you take away his interception yards interception return yards from the yards he allowed he's at something like 2.0 yards per target for the season last year and, and you know, the, the guy who stood out above all corners was Devin Witherspoon. I can't believe that there was a discussion about him and Gonzalez because all I can say is I'm not going to let any evaluator arrogance get in the way of statistics that stand, you know, here and here in terms of two players um, like that. And in, in, in the case of Forbes, I almost felt like I would have been doing that as well. But Gonzalez brings so many physical traits to the table that he was a, he was an exciting guy in that respect. And then he went right the, the very next pick to new England uh, after Forbes was taken. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about Yassin and what is a good season and a bad season for him. Let's start with a good season. Let's do it just the way we did last time with likely. Yeah. So um, I think number one is establish himself as the top uh, either two or three corner, depending on any potential uh, free agent moves that they make or, um, trades during the season that he still remains uh, either the top two or three cornerback uh, for the defense. Um, and I, I, again, like I, I think if he is just the player that he's been for his entire career, 
I think that is a good season for him. Um, be that solid corner, um, not, you know, not give up a, a bunch of big, big plays and, you know, hopefully even get your hands on a couple of balls uh, during the season would make a, uh, would make a, would be a good season for him. I, I really like what you said there. And in particular, I don't think it really matters too much if he's the number two or number three corner, but he's providing value when he plays. And it's if they got back Marcus Peters, could be a rotational system, could be a lot of ways that you would bring those guys in. I go back to Marlon Humphrey's team MVP year, which I think was 2018, if I recall. 2017? Might have been 2017. I think seventeen. Yeah, okay. but he, what, what, he, yeah, and he never started. Yeah, it, it, he was he was on the field rotationally and, and and doing that. It's just you know incredible that you you've got a player like that. But um, to to me, if the if the if we're not talking about who's at left cornerback with lots of loud expletives during this season, that's a really good thing. And I don't really care if it's Yasin or Peters who's playing there or even somebody else. Uh, but to me. I, I said produces much like 2022, so very similar with the Ravens defense with somewhat improved tackling. I do think he's got to fix that to a small degree and alleviates the Ravens' depth concerns with 750-plus snaps played. Now, I'm going to back off that one, and I'm going to say basically I, that I agree with you more and that if as long as the two, three guys are working out and he's one of those three guys, and however they want to divide up the snaps is fine as long as the Ravens are getting quality play out of that position, not, not, you know, league average, slightly above league average, not, you know, replacement level play, obviously. Um, but if Yassin could be a part of that and contribute, a, you know, some, some snaps to that, um, I don't think he needs to even get the whole 750. And that has been a problem over his career. He's been injured off and on and missed some games. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He, that, I was about to mention, yeah, he, he, he hasn't played 15 games in a season uh, since his rookie year. And he's pretty much been around that 12 or 13, uh, you know, for these last three years. So injuries have been a concern. Good thing is it's no major injuries. It's not like he's torn up his knee and he's, you know, recovering from something like that. It's been ankle sprains, uh, muscle pulls, things like that, that are, you know, more nagging and, you know, than, you know, something serious. So you, you shouldn't see any you, you hope to not see any physical decline from him, you know, like you would if he had a major knee injury or something or Achilles or something like that. All right, move on to what's a great season for Yasin in terms of uh, uh, that. Yeah, so I would say uh, number one is play of injury free season, um, you know, play, you know, 16 to 17 games for the season. Um respond well by being the guy that's probably going to get the most targets in this defense um, play, you know, be, be very solid in coverage um, and, and actually get your hands on some balls and get, you know, maybe four or five interceptions in the season. If he plays the way he plays and gets about four or five interceptions, he's, you know, he's probably elevating himself to a borderline pro bowl player. Um, with that. So uh, I think that would be a great season for him. Swing for the fences kind of call there. I, I like it. Um, what, what do you think is the percentage chance that, that like what kind of a percentile season in the, in the universe of possible 2023 Rocky Sin results would that be that, that he's a borderline pro ball player with four or five picks and, you know, basically is healthy the whole year. Uh, yeah. I, that's a, Yeah. 95 percent yeah, there you go <laughs> i was at the same point when i yeah. when i heard it i say so i i went for the 80th percentile and always I've, I've gone for the 60th and 80th in terms of a good and great season to me a great season is finds an area of improvement with the move to a better defense that's similar to what happened to roquan you know that the, the defense suddenly seems to hide some of the problems he has and and even accentuates some of the things he's good at. And I'm not picky about what that is. It could be anything. It could be ball skills. It could be tackling. It could be yak reduction. It could be better contestation at the cast catch point. I would like, it could be turnover generation. It could be second man to the ball skills where he comes in and is a guy who falls on fumbles regularly or strips as a second man to the ball kind of thing. Any of that would be fine. And also he, he turns in an 850 plus snap season which should be largely being healthy. I think he'd have to play about 14 games for that. So I'm trying to be a little bit realistic about, you know, not expecting him to play every single game, but, but still 
you know, I, I, to me that that could be an 80th percentile um, uh, result. And I think also I'm giving myself a lot of leeway, obviously, which you were, you were, you reach for the stars, which is good. Um, but I'm giving yourself a lot of leeway in, in different ways that he could improve and doesn't have to improve in every one of those categories, but if he improves in four out of six, you know, I think he, mm -hmm. he, he ends up being a, a, a valuable Ravens player that fits into this defense very well. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think, I think he's a, a solid pickup. Um, I, I just hope, I, my, my biggest thing for him is, you know, he continues his play and just is able to get more turnovers, um, you know, through interceptions or, you know, maybe even learning from Marlon how to rip that ball out at the, you know, right at the catch point and, you know, get a few forced fumbles as well. All right. Outstanding. Always fun to talk with you, Brandon. We're, we're going to plan to be on again, I'm sure. Uh, tell folks where they can talk football with you online. Sure. I'm uh, on Twitter at uh, Brandon Croxton five and uh, love to talk football, love to talk Ravens, uh, love the game and looking forward to looking forward to the season. All right. Outstanding, Brandon. Other folks out there who'd like to be on a film study short, still lots of time in July to do that. Uh, it's a great time in the off season to talk about whatever is on your mind in terms of scheme, general GM chair stuff you'd like to talk about, franchise building. It talks about uh, that one play episode. We can still do that if you'd like. Uh, there's opportunities to get on with a couple of, of uh, uh, pairings left on these two-player expectation shows. If you'd like to do that, hit me up with a DM. I'll get right back to you. Brandon, thanks a ton for coming on again. Oh, thank you. Love, uh, love talking. To, love, love it. It's a very fun time. I will talk to you next time on Film Study.